Hi everyone, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and a variety of other places when you search for my name or um, Make Moments Matter Music Education. I'm so excited to be back. It's been a couple weeks. Um, last week I was on my fall break. I was able to visit family. It was really exciting and I'm glad to be back and to be sharing some lesson ideas with y'all today. Um, my plan for today is to talk a little bit about a, a couple different things. It's sort of an off week. Last week I shared all my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons for the week. And this week um, I'm still on those same lessons. I'm on a seven day um, lesson rotation. And so it feels like it's been a long time, uh, but I'm still teaching those lessons. So instead of boring you by talking through all those lessons again, uh, because also you can just go back and watch them, I suppose, um, the last video. I'm going to talk a little bit about children's books, uh, where I get them, why I get them the way I do. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about lesson planning because I'm, I'm doing that for my next rotation of um, lessons. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about folk dance because that's sort of um, the focus of one of the um, class grades I'm going with right now and also sort of the focus of an upcoming concert. So that's the plan. Um, but really quick, if you uh, need a refresher, you can always click on my LinkedIn profile if you're on Instagram, or you can click at the link at the bottom of this video caption to go to the links page on my blog, makemomentsmatter.org. Um, and you can find all the resources, the lesson books, the um, links, everything I talk about today in this video should be there. And if they're not, send me a message and I'll add them. Um, you can also join in the conversation after the video is over if you join Every Moment Matters. Um, uh, music education community. It's a Facebook group on um, Facebook and you can join it and, and continue on asking questions, get advice from really great uh, other teachers who are also seeking ideas and advice. Um, so that's there for you if you're interested. One more thing. Um, I very recently was in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was my pleasure to uh, present with the Central Arkansas ORF chapter. Um, a really fun chapter and it was great to go and share. I'm going to be sharing again, not in Arkansas, but um, in another part of the world. I'll be with the Tidewater Orf, um, Tidewater Area Orf chapter, which is in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. I think it'll be at Old Dominion University and that's on October 19th. So if you are going to be uh, in Norfolk, Virginia or want to be in Norfolk, Virginia uh, in October, you should come. We'd love to have you. And there's a link um, to that event page on the links page in case you want to learn more information about Tidewater Area Orf Chapter or this specific workshop in, in uh, well, this specific workshop. Okay, that's, um, that's the extent of my um, announcements, I guess. Um, so let me get started. I want to start by talking about children's books. You know I've been sharing in the last couple weeks about books that I'm using for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, I've been sharing a lot of those books. I actually just did an entire blog post about books that you can use for Hispanic Heritage Month, some different kinds of books you can use. Um, and then I, I put links to a lot of those books on that blog post. So that's at makemomentsmatter.org. You can find the most recent blog post about those books if you haven't been following along the last couple weeks as I've been sharing. Um, a couple more books that just came in not too long ago. I actually have maybe one more on the way. But um, I think I shared about this maybe on social media but didn't share in a video. It's called Drum Dream Girl. Um, this is a really, really cool book and very unique. Um, because it tells, uh, I mean, uh, it tells a story about, um, it says right here, inspired by a Chinese African Cuban girl who broke Cuba's traditional taboo against female drummers. And so it's this really cool, unique story about um, a little girl who wants to be a drummer in Cuba and how she's really not allowed. And then she keeps at it. She keeps trying. She keeps, you know, feeling these rhythms and these beats in her heart. And she keeps... She keeps trying, she keeps going for it, but the drums are locked up. I love this, this image. Um, and it says, and even though everyone kept reminding her that girls on the island of music had never played drums, the brave drum dream girl dared to play tall conga drums, small bongo drums, and big round silvery bright moon bright timbales. So it's a super cool book. And of course you already heard from that quick intro that she does and eventually get to play. Um, and it's really cool. Her parents buy in. They get her um, a, a teacher who's like, yeah, I know she's really talented. <laughs> um, her teacher was amazed. The girl knew so much, but he taught her more and more and more. And she practiced and she practiced and she practiced. I love that part. But it's just a really, really cool book. And it really um, is, 
I think really fascinating for a mix of cultures. It's great to encourage um, our young girls. It's great to encourage all students in drumming. Um, but again, perfect for this month or any time of year. And beautiful, beautiful photos. So that's one that I've um, recently been reading. Another one, and we're talking about percussion, is Tito Puente, uh, Mambo King. And this is another great book that has the Spanish and the English um, alongside one another. So in this book by Monica Brown, if you look, um, it just says, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clap your hands for Tito Puente, the Mambo King, plays and sways as people dance, the Mambo, the Rumba, and the Cha Cha. Tum tic a tac tic, tum tac tum tum, tum tic tum tum. I need to reread that. And then it goes, damas y caballeros, niños y niñas, aplaudan a Tito Puente, el rey del mambo, toca su música. And then it goes through, so it has all the Spanish words here if you wanted to read through them. But if you want to just pull out a couple things, I'm sure that would be a great experience for kids too, but it has all that right here. Um, it goes through and tells his story. It talks about how he wanted to be a drummer. Um, all of the things, um, like his life growing up in Spanish Harlem and all, how everyone sort of identified him as this great musician early on and how he was really, you know, seemed to have a gift early, early, early on. Um, and he performed, he did great things, and then he was part of the war. He joined the Navy. Um, it's just a really fascinating story, <clears throat> talking about his life and how he finally, finally um, had his dream come true when he was able to lead his own big band. And it talks about um, a little bit about the great things that he did. I love, again, when they flip the book like this and you get a, a much bigger picture. It talks about when he won his first Grammy. But what's really cool about this one, on, on each page or every couple pages, it has this tum tic a tac tic tum ta tum tic tum. I can't quite read it in order. But if you don't know, which I didn't know, it says follow this simple rumba beat, and then it says tum tic a tac tic tum tic tum tum, and it says this is traditionally played with three instruments: the bongos, the congas, and the timbales. And so it's cool to have that notation in there to give a little bit of a, a backstory about that. Um, but again, just another really great book to have on your shelf to use not just Hispan during Hispanic Heritage Month, but any time of year. Um, I have a, a couple more books coming in I'm so excited about. Where am I getting books? Let me talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> the resources and the places where I find books. Um, because in my most recent blog post, I shared a, bunch, a list of books. I need to add on the bottom another part, and I'm planning to do that tomorrow. But on, on that blog post, um, I'm going to write a little bit about where you can get books. So a couple ideas. Um, I have a huge Amazon list. Um, Amazon allows me to make an, an ideas list, it calls it, where I can share all of my favorite books and resources and things. Doesn't mean you have to buy it on Amazon. And in fact, sometimes if you click through to the books, it will say no longer in inventory or buy used from these sellers or whatever. And it may not have it as you know prime available or maybe not even available at all. So why include it on the list? Well, the nice thing is that Amazon lets me put them all in one place. And so whether you decide to get it from Amazon or go to your local library or find it somewhere else, if it's in that ideas list, you always have a place where you can go back and find it. You can click through, get the ISBN number if you want it. Um, you can get all the information about the book and see a few images. That's the great thing about Amazon that it lets you do that. Um, whether you're going to buy it or not. You can see a couple images from inside the book. So a couple other places where you can get books. Um, I've talked before about a really great discount book website called Better World Books. Better World Books, I've sort of realized that they like go to all the Goodwills in the country and like library book sales and they buy up all of these sort of gently used sometimes um, library discard books and then they sell them online dirt cheap. So like if you were to get a book like this one, like Tito Puente, I don't know if it's available on Better World Books. I didn't check before I started this video, but usually a book like this is anywhere from $3.98 to $6.98. They're not expensive. Like, and this one, if you were to buy it brand new from Amazon, would be $17.99. So that's expensive. <laughs> or, I mean, if you're going to buy it from like Barnes and Noble, Amazon's probably a little bit cheaper, but um, it, it's nice to be able to go to those discount book websites and get books a little bit cheaper. Another book website just like that, just like betterworldbooks.com, is another one called thriftbooks.com. And that's another great book that has those discount books. I think they go to those library sales and they get all those um, discarded books. 
The only thing about thrift books is that you have to have a $35 minimum for free shipping. Better World Books most of the time just does free shipping no matter the, no matter the, um, the total. So I, I prefer Better World Books for that reason, but um, you can use either one. They might be a little bit cheaper on thriftbooks.com. I haven't checked. I haven't really compared apples to apples with that. Um, but like I said, those are two great book sites. If you go to my links page, I have both of those linked there and you can click through and um, check out. You sometimes can find a lot of things that maybe your pocketbook wouldn't want you to find, but there are some really great books for really not a lot of money. So it's, it's a great place to find discount books. Another one that um, uh, a, unit, um, a teacher out there recently sent me uh, a link to and was like, hey, if you like Better World Books, you should check out um, is bookoutlet.com. I had never heard of it before. The difference between Better World Books and thriftbooks.com and Book Outlet is that Book Outlet does not have used books. It has new books. And so I think what they do is that they buy up a lot of books that are <clears throat> just haven't sold um, and somehow have made their way to a discount book website. But Book Outlet has brand new books for very low prices. So let me just show you. This is my most recent, um, I have a problem confession, I don't know. Okay, so I went to Book Outlet and I bought nine brand new children's books and the total was $53 for nine books, nine books. So let me just show you in case you're like, oh, they're probably not very cool books. Okay, there's this awesome book called The Snowman Shuffle which I'm very excited about. I'm going to share about later on this school year. Um, this one is a really, really popular one. You've probably seen it on a lot of blogs, on Instagram and other places. Um, it's an illustrated version of Singing in the Rain. Um, and this is by um, Tim Hopgood. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. And let's see. Let me just check and see how much this cost me. Um, that one cost me a whopping six fifty, dollars which is not normally that price. Normally it retails for $18 if you're gonna buy it from Barnes & Noble. So super low price. Let's see what else I got for my haul of uh, books for $53. Okay, I also got Tito Puente in that haul. Let's see. I also got Dolly Parton's Coat of Many Colors. Again, just a, a, an illustrated version of her very popular song. Super, super cool book, this version. Let's see. Uh, Walking in a Winter Wonderland. Obviously, that's going to come out later this year. This is another Tim Hopgood um, illustrat illustrated book. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful illustrations. Let me just pop through. Like, really cool. It's, a, um, again, just an illustrated version of the very popular song. Like, this is another one you've probably seen a lot on, um, like, Instagram or people's pictures of their rooms. Super cool. Super cheap on Book Outlet. Um, Over the River and Through the Woods, another illustrated version. I was buying <laughs> for what I'm going to need to use later this year, obviously. Another Tim Hopgood, um, What a Wonderful World, another illustrated version of that. Um, this really, really cool version of Over the River and Through the Woods. You can see it's got a little foil there. Um, but this one ha I think is just so cool. It t retells the story, um, has these gorgeous pictures. Um, super fun illustrations. I got this one called The 12 Days of Thanksgiving. Awesome, fun little song goes with 12 Days of Christmas, the, the sung version, but Thanksgiving theme. Um, again, cool picture. It's going to be fun to use with kids. And then this book, Run Turkey Run. Obviously, I was thinking ahead to Thanksgiving and Christmas and what I'm going to use later this year. But all those books, nine books for $53 is crazy for children's books. So... Um, I can attest bookoutlet.com is wonderful and you should check it out. Um, so, okay, places you can get books that I've talked about already, thriftbooks.com, betterworldbooks.com, bookoutlet.com. Both, all three of those are linked on my links page, um, on um, the, the links page for this video. Um, I'd also say, like I said, you can go to the Amazon page where I have them all listed and just take the ISBN and then go to your local library or get on your library's website and search and see if you can get those books brought in, if you can rent them, maybe your school library has them, maybe your school library has a budget to buy books and would buy some of those for you. That's another great resource. Um, one thing that I did this weekend, I do love my online bookstores and I do love um, being able to get some of those things discounted, which is great. But I also have 
no problem buying full price um, if I'm buying them from a great bookstore. So I was visiting my sister and my nephews and my brother-in-law in, -law in um, Decorah, Iowa, a pretty small town in Northeast Iowa. And there's a really wonderful bookstore called um, Dragonfly Books. And I went in and I was just like, we were looking around, just whatever, and I randomly found this book called Drum City. And it's so cool. And the paperback version was not that expensive, but even so I was willing to pay the price to, to buy it there because it's a, such a cool bookstore. I want it to stay open for my nephews and for my sister and for when I come back and visit. But a really, really cool book with some amazing illustrations. Um, and I'm planning to use this with lessons later, but it, just part of it sounds like this. Drum, jump to the sound, dance all around. Loud on the tubs and the tins that they found. March calls the boy in the yard full of drums. Hundreds and hundreds of drums. Well, they're not really playing drums. They're pay playing trash cans and pots and pans and whisks and all sorts of things that they found. It's a super cool book, but I think I had seen it before, but just never bought it. And, you know, it was there and it felt right. It was the good timing. So I got it. And there are so many places you can find books. Um, I love that Karen is mentioning you should look for grants. Um, there are really great, oh, rats. <laughs> there are really great grants for uh, books that you can find. And I see Tiffany just said Drum City's on Book Outlet for three ninety eight. <laughs> rats. <laughs> well, no, it was worth it. I bought it at a local bookstore. It was totally worth it. Anyway, um, there are so many great places where you can buy books, and it's totally worth it. I love integrating them into my classroom. I love loaning them out to teachers in my building to use. Um, I love um, finding videos that go along where you can find like um, Storyline Online, some other places like that where you find famous folks reading the books. You could even take a video of yourself reading the book and post it for just your schools for your students to read. Lots of amazing opportunities to use books in the classroom. But I hope that gives you a couple ideas. So like I said, my Amazon ideas list is there in case you want to go back and see what books uh, you could use in the music room. Doesn't mean you have to buy them from Amazon. I talked about a bunch of places you can find them or go to your library or um, have someone give it to you as a Christmas gift or whatever. Um, but that ideas list is there in case you want to go back and just see all of, uh, a lot of cool books that you could get for your classroom. Okay, um, let me do a quick switch and talk a little bit about lesson planning. Um, I wanted to include a little bit about lesson planning today because um, today was the last day of my seven day rotation. So tomorrow I start new lessons. So today at school, um, I was doing some of that lesson planning and I just wanted to share a couple things that might be helpful um, for new teachers or old teachers or teachers who are thinking about lesson plans and how do you prepare your lesson plans. Um, so I have all of my lesson plans in a physical book. I, I like that. My principals prefer that they have it so in case they come in for an unexpected observation um, that they can just grab my lesson plan book and flip through. I also have to uh, scan all my lesson plans and submit them to my admin on the line. And so they have to have a record of that. Well, I, I do it the old fashioned way. I know I could sit down and type it out. I know I could do all of that, but I actually like to go in and physically write down what I'm doing in my lessons. That's just me. Uh, you know, I realized I'm not a good note taker on a laptop. I got to write it out. So for, for that sort of same reason, I like writing out on my lesson plans, but not everyone likes to do that. I understand. So do find a way that works for you to, to plan out, to figure out what you're going to do for lessons, um, whether it's electronic or written or whatever. Um, find the way that works for you and then stick with that. See how that works for you. Let me show you. I've shared a, li um, a little before about my lesson plan template, but let me just show a couple things. So in every lesson plan, there's probably more. Well, I know there's more on my lesson plans than what I actually need to teach the lesson. And that's on purpose. Um, I do that for a couple reasons. And let me show you my template so I can sort of explain why. So um, on this template, I have a lot of boxes and it feels like there's a lot of information and there is. And the reason for that is because I want them to be functional for me and also for my administrators. And so like along the top, I have different boxes where I can check off that says focus area, my Georgia standards of excellence, my objectives, and my state checkpoints. So I fill all that information out every week, and I know that I probably don't have to for myself. Like, I know that, like, in the moment of the lesson, I don't really need that. But what I do need is my, I need my administrators to know that I'm on task, that I, ha I know where I'm going with my lessons for the year. I have plans for my yearly goals. I want them to see all of that. And when an administrator looks at something like this, they go, oh, 
check this, check this, check this. Here's the stated objective. Here's the checkpoints we're working on in this lesson. Here's how it applies. And that really works for my administrators. I've never had an administrator say like, I don't really understand what you're doing or why. Like this gives them all of that feedback. And, and not only just like, oh, David's doing this lesson because he thinks it's cool. No, like it, they can see they're doing, he's doing this lesson because he's hitting this state checkpoint because he's following this district um, checkpoint or district ob objective. So giving that information is, it, it is important for me as I'm planning to make sure I am hitting those, but mostly it's for my administrators so they know when they look that they can see I'm getting it too. The next thing that I would say is I always put in a little box that says review and then present. And that's just so that I know like, oh yeah, I did teach this. I don't need to like teach this lesson like it's brand new. I can teach it just I like I, I can review it this time if it's in my review box and if it's in the present box then I know that I need to um, give it a little bit more weight and a little bit more time. What's um, fun sometimes if I have the review here and then I'll have an arrow that says like oh new extension to that lesson and sometimes that helps me remember like oh I started it here but I need to add blah 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 in this lesson. And then another thing that my administrators really 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 love to see is how am I planning to assess. And sometimes that just is informal assessment or on demand or by observation. But by checking off something there, that really helps my administrators know that I'm on task. So then I also have one more box before I actually get to my lesson plans. I know it's a lot. But there's a box that says materials needed and one that says vocabulary. So the vocabulary is important for me so I know what to highlight and pull out in every lesson and just say a few more times because kids need that review. But I also like the materials needed so that I know like, ooh, I'm going to need that DVD before we start. Or I'm going to need um, the egg shakers. I'm going to need to pull up this thing on my laptop to so make sure it's ready to go. Having those boxes, that's really the most important uh, pre-game thing that I can do so that I can uh, have all of the resources and things that I need ready and I can be mentally prepared. Then in the lesson, I do refer to these as I'm teaching. Um, I have three sort of boxes and I call it like Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 because I have 45 minute lessons and so I sort of have to break that down into what uh, some smaller chunks um, for my kids' sake, for my sake, so that I can really sort of think about what my process is for the lesson. And sometimes that's, you know, act one, initiate or begin song or whatever, and then act two is like this extension, and act three is this other extension, or give kids a chance to create or whatever. And it maybe is the same song for the whole day, but I'm, you know, tasking out what are the steps of that. Um, I've been teaching nine years. It's still helpful for me to write in the steps because what if the class before there was a kid who had a huge blow up and you're just mentally like shaken having that in your lesson plans instead of just saying like little Liza Jane like little Liza Jane start with the background and then go into etc cetera, etc cetera, and then bring in the instruments and then whatever having that written out helps you in case you're jumping into it or someone threw up on you and you had to go change clothes really quick and now you're jumping back into the lesson I mean that that stuff happens so having sort of all of that written out for me is helpful. It doesn't mean I'm writing out things word for word, but I will write in the process for that. And that does help me figure out where I'm going with things. So I make sure I have all my steps written down. I make sure that I have what I need ready to go so I can grab that and go. An assessment, that's great for my um, administrators. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, I show I show how I'm planning. I show how, how I do all that for my administrator's sake. And then let me show you once I've set my lesson plans, I know I've talked about this before, but I have this song and poem map. And basically all it is is I, I talk about the songs and the poems and the activities and everything I've done in a month. And I write it out here so that when I'm coming back like in May or January or whenever and I need to say like, ooh, I've got 10 minutes, what song could we pull out? I can run through here and go, ooh, we did this song. Or if I think like, I need to teach this other concept, but I don't want to have to introduce a new song. What do we already know where I could pull that out and, and add that thing in? Going through this list is so much easier than like flipping through 12 different pages of things and trying to look through like the different sections to find different songs. If I have it on that list, it makes my life a lot easier. Um, so both the lesson plan template and the song and poem um, map are available for free on my Teachers Pay Teachers store. Um, you can go get them. There are links to those on the links page. But if you want, you can, you can do all of that. One thing I would say about the song and poem map is that I color code. If I've introduced a song, I do it in purple. A poem is green. An activity or a special act, um, extension or vocabulary I put in like hot pink. And, and that just helps me to sort of 
you know, see as I'm going along, you know, oh, that's this thing, that's this thing, that's this thing. So now as I'm putting in the lessons, before I, you know, submit them to admin and whatever, I go through, I make sure I've got all of that on the map, I record all of that, and then I send it off to admin and hole punch it and put it in my three ring binder. But that helps me plan, it helps me make sure that I've got everything on the right track and helps me sort of keep track of where I've been and where I'm going. And um, one of the things about this lesson plan, I write into it physically, but it is editable. So if you wanted, you could go in, you could type into it if that's your thing. Um, you can save it as a PDF, you can change the boxes around. Um, I think the one on Teachers Pay Teachers has the national standards. Um, I changed mine to the Georgia standards. Um, you could change the focus area so that you can write down what you know your district focus areas are, what you're focusing on. Um, so that you can you know check those off as you go but one of the things about word is that you know like if you have something formatted in a nice way and you go in and click enter and there's that meme that's like I was in word and I clicked enter and 17 boxes disappeared and everything moved down four pages and all my text is gone and in the distance I hear sirens like if, if you mess around with formatting sometimes it messes up the document so I've tried to make this as editable and as friendly as I can so that you can go in and change things as needed if you want. Um, okay, but that's just me. I'm, not, I'm the kind of person who writes out my lessons, so I don't, I don't know. I haven't played around with the editing for a while, so I hope so works. But, but uh, go in, play around, change things if you want. But if you want, that template is there on Teachers Pay Teachers for free. So let's see if I've hit everything. Um, my plan, the song and poem map. Um, tracking through your lesson. Yeah, and I know some people don't have to submit to their um, administrators. I don't hate it. Um, the nice thing about it is they're, uh, like they can't say like, oh, we didn't know what you were doing. Well, I submitted all my lessons to you, so I hope you do. But uh, I mean, it does help with communication because when I go into meetings, when I go into other things, they can say like, oh yeah, I was checking through and I saw that you're doing such and such. Or they can see my literacy connections or they can see the vocabulary connections that I'm making or they can see that I'm you know, making that, that special effort to make connections with other areas or to emphasize certain things. So I don't mind submitting it to administrators. I used to think it was a burden, but now I sort of think it's a way for me to advocate with them um, and to tell them a little bit more about um, what I'm doing in my classroom. Um, Monica says, there are people who don't have to submit lesson plans. <laughs> what kind of unicorn magic is that? I know, I, I worked in buildings that um, don't have to submit, but I have worked in many buildings where you do have to submit. And I, I try not to think of it as like an accountability thing, but as more of a like, again, a way to connect with my administrators. I see some really hilarious, <laughs> a really hilarious uh, commentary about, I am submitting, I'm not submitting. Um, but you know, it's all just a little bit different. I know some schools require specific templates. I see Monica saying that there's a really long template you have to do. But um, you know, depending on what you want, maybe you submit, you, maybe you don't have to submit anything at all, or maybe submit something small, but writing out for me, all of these things does help me in my daily lessons. I'm gonna make sure I've caught everything here in the commentary. If there's anything else I need to talk about before I get going. Uh, Kimberly says, I'm using your song log and I also keep the list of books that I've read on there. That is brilliant. I'm gonna start doing that to make sure I have all of that connected. Uh, Karen says, administrators go, oh, music has standards? Yep, I have definitely had administrators say that. Um, let's see. Great, that's some really good commentary about lesson plan ideas. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope that, that helps. And like I said, those templates are free on Teachers Pay Teachers in case you want them. Um, they're not perfect, but you can edit them and, and make them a little bit better for your context if you want. Okay, so let me talk just a little bit. We've already talked about books, where you can buy books, where you can get books, what great books you can find. Um, I talked a little bit about lesson planning, especially um, as it relates to like sharing with administrators. Um, and, and getting that information across. And now let's talk about folk dancing. I love folk dancing. Um, my third graders um, are gonna be doing a family folk dance night. Um, I'm doing that in conjunction with the PE teachers and I'm so excited. Um, I've never done one before. So if you have done a family folk dance night and you have tips or ideas or thoughts, please send me some ideas. 
Um, I'd love to get your thoughts and your um, commentary about how that would maybe work well for you or how it has worked well for you um, and, and what you think would be great to include. So currently, I'll, I'll tell you, my plan with the Family Folk Dance Night is to do three or four songs where the students show the parents, where like we have demonstrations of here's what we learned in our class um, and, and here's you know this cool dance or whatever. Um, I see Emmy asking, is the Folk Dance Night in place of a grade level concert or in addition? For me, it's in place of a grade level concert. I've never done it before, but I'm, I'm hoping and I think it's gonna be great. So the, I'm gonna do three or four songs where we show uh, what we've done in class, some things we've already learned. And then I want to do three or four songs where we actually like grab our parents and make them do the dances with us. So that means for me, I need to plan in a couple songs that are a little bit more technically interesting, a little bit more difficult that the kids can like master and do for the parents. And then a couple that are a little bit easier, honestly, because if you're teaching your dance to the parents on the night of, they're gonna be learning along with their kids and their kids are probably gonna be trying to intervene to like teach them the dance moves and that's not gonna make it any easier. So um, my plan is to have a few things that we already know, a few things that, well, I hope the kids know all of them, but um, a few things that we're just gonna show and a few things we're gonna teach to our parents. Now, my PE teachers are actually teaching some of these dances at the same time. So my third graders are getting instruction from me. They're also getting it from the PE teachers. We're sort of dividing the labor a little bit right now. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to do a couple maybe of the more technically difficult songs or that involve like props or things like that. Um, I'm also teaching the songs that are um, that include singing. So one of the songs I'm going to talk about in a second is a song called Old Brass Wagon. Well, you sing as you d dance and do it, unlike maybe like a, a, a jig or... Um, like a reel where all you're doing is the dancing. What we do on some of these songs is we sing and we dance. So for those ones, I'm taking the lead and I'm teaching those. My PE teachers are teaching some of the basic like line dances, square dances, that sort of thing that the parents could maybe join in and be a part of. Um, I'm following up a little bit in the music room, but um, I'm letting the PE teachers run with that and they're very excited about that. Um, so those are sort of the ideas right now the songs that i'm actively teaching in my classroom um i taught the grumpy march i taught sasha i taught old brass wagon and i'm about to teach uh, los machetes um which is a really fun dance we're going to do with rhythm sticks and not machetes <laughs> um the pe teacher uh, recently taught a line dance they're going to be teaching a circle dance or a square dance i think next um and then we're going to put it all together the week before the the folk dance, we're gonna practice it in the gym. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have three or four of the homerooms come at like 5.30 and then three or four, the rest of the homerooms come at like seven so that we can have the full folk dance night with only half the classes. I have such a huge number of kids that if we brought them all in at the same time, it would be disastrous. So we're gonna sort of split down the middle and see what happens. That's sort of um, our hope. Who knows if that's gonna work. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We've never done it at our school before, so we'll see. So some of my thoughts about folk dancing, um, <clears throat> and I'll just quickly run through some really great resources first. Um, I linked a couple things on the links page, but a couple books that I want to really highlight. Um, Karen says, try the smidgy. For third graders, I don't know. I, that'd be tricky. I don't know. <laughs> my third graders. Ooh, this is also the, the sixth time I've seen him, so that might be a little bit much right now. Um, okay, so this book, uh, Sashay the Donut, and all the books from the New England Dancing Masters are just fabulous books. And in fact, if you don't know the Grumpy March, and I just mentioned that when you're like, oh, the Grumpy March, what's that? It's in here. Sasha is in here. Well, Sasha's in a bunch of different places, but Sasha's here. There are so many great dances that you can find in here and their notes and their ideas are just absolutely wonderful. There's some fantastic pictures, um, great explanations, um, some really fun little like helpful tips and tricks. So um, I think it's a, a great, great, great resource and all of their books are just fabulous. There's actually a blog post um, 
that it's on the AOSA member resource library. So if you're a member of the American North Shulbrook Association, um, I linked it on my links page. And if you're a member, you can click through and read it. But it's, um, it's by Peter Amidon, who's one of the New England Dancing Masters. Um, and it's called like Peter Amidon's Almost Completely Random Tips. or so. It's something silly like that, but it has all these really fabulous tips about teaching folk dance. So anything in any of these books is golden, but his, his article on the AOSA website is also fabulous. So if you're an AOSA member, um, you can click through and you can read that, and it's a really, really, really great resource. Um, there are a couple other books that I think are just really great. Um, this one called Teaching Movement and Dance by Phyllis Weicker is just a fantastic resource to have. Um, it has a tons and tons and tons of dances, um, some really great and simple um, explanations. And I mean, Phyllis Weicker was just a really fantastic uh, pedagogue and movement teacher. And so this is a, a an amazing book and also just like ginormous <laughs> it's like maybe bigger than a dictionary I don't know it's so huge um, so absolutely fantastic this is a great book to have there's this book called creative dance for all ages um, this is an old um, edition by Anne Green Gilbert there's actually a, a, a more recent edition that I think I linked on the links page but creative dance for all ages is another great one especially if you're like hmm I can teach folk dance but not movement or I can teach folk dance but not more expressive dance I'm a little nervous about that this is a great book to get um, I got it for five dollars <laughs> um, again hooray for ORF my local ORF chapter at the end of every year teachers who are retiring bring in all their resources and do like a little garage sale I got it for five dollars it's a fantastic fantastic book so ask around see if you can find a great copy of that um, one more that I got in my ORF level so it was recommended by my movement teacher is this one called lesson plans for creative dance so this is another one where if you're like hmm, I don't know I'm a little nervous about this creative dance part um, this one is great. It connects with literature. It connects with art. It connects um, all different ideas and it has poetry. It has pictures. It has really great examples in here. So it's a fantastic resource if you're interested. Um, I've linked this on the links page as well. So you can go through and check out, that out. And that is Lesson Plans for Creative Dance by Sally Carline. Okay, those are some really great resources you can use. Um, but let me just talk about some of the tips that have come up in the last week um, as I've been teaching my students. I think the, the first thing and the biggest thing for me when I'm thinking about teaching a big folk dance um, or I'm teaching a, a dance with consecutive parts like the Grumpy March or Sasha or something else is that I like to think about simplify, simplify, simplify. Like I don't teach to the final form. I don't think of it as like a... Um, a recipe of like first this then this then this then this then this I, I do keep that in my head but as I'm teaching kids every part needs to be important I need to simplify all of it so I teach it in parts and and go for mastery of each part before I move on so for instance the grumpy march it starts out with this figure where you're in a long way set and you're looking at your partner and you cross you do it like a cross by their right shoulder turn and then do clap right clap left and then you walk past them again, you turn and do clap, right, clap, left. So instead of saying like, okay, walk by your partner's shoulder and then clap, right, clap, left, I go, oh my gosh, you have to do a grumpy face and this song is all about being grumpy. Mm. You're gonna be so grumpy, I want you to walk past your partner without even looking at them and then take their spot and turn around and glare like you're so grumpy. The kids get really good at that, <laughs> right? So I go say, grump, 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 turn. Oh, good. Now do it again. Grump, 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 turn. Oh, good. You're back to your spot. Great. You know what? We're going to add something. So you're going to go grump, 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 turn. And then super not happy. You got to be grumpy. You're going to go clap, right, clap, left. And they try it. And then I say, oh, good. Now grump back. Grump, 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 turn. Now clap, right, clap, let, ooh, let's see if we can put that all together. And we go just a tiny bit faster. Ooh, wow, can you grump even faster? And we go just a, a, almost up to speed. 
But instead of saying like, okay, here's what you do, you're gonna cross body partner, clap right, clap left, cross body partner, clap right. I feel like kids learn it a little bit better if I, if I emphasize and slow down and simplify. Instead of doing the pass, clap right, clap left, pass, clap right, I started out with just pass, just pass, and then clap right, clap left. I sort of layered that in. It, it slows things down, but it means that they've mastered the bigger part first, the movement, and then we add in the little extra part. Same with the next part. The next part of that dance, is that they all sort of turn to their right and they go down the um, down the long way set in whichever direction they're facing and what ha it's actually a really pretty quick switch because it goes down the line down the line down the line turn around and skip back skip back skip back skip back skip back skip back to your spot right so that's that's sort of tricky for kids so instead I just say ooh turn to your right and I actually have to say like the red line turn and face the window the blue line turn and face the front door and they turn and then we like walk through how to do it and instead of just walking for eight beats and then turning i have them walk for maybe eight sixteen so they get the idea of walking down their line and switching lines and coming down the other way if you've ever done this dance you i hope know what i'm talking about but that instead of having them just go five six seven eight turn go back and so I just have them walk so they get the whole path. And then I have them turn and walk all the way back out of time, just so they get the idea of how to get there and get back. And then I'll add in like, ooh, good, now let's go. So we grump, grump down the line. And then I go, ooh, you need to get back faster, get back faster. And so instead of, so they walk back a little faster and I go, and that wasn't fast enough. Walk back again, you walk down, walk down. Walk. Now this time, instead of walking back really fast, you gotta skip back to your spot. That was what I originally wanted them to get to anyway, but instead of starting with skipping, I started with walk back quick, or just walk back where you are. And so then I go, oh, you're gonna skip back, but you can't be happy, you have to be grumpy. And they grump back, skip grumpy back, all the way back. Starting with the simple things and just like getting them to do the movement first is more important than, than getting them to do it in time right away. Because getting them to do it in time will happen once they know the moves. So I worry more about the movement and the path and then getting them back in time, getting them to do it with the music. I, I don't do the music until much, much, much later. And then I'll sequence in, I'll say, ooh, I hope you remember the first part. It's grump, 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 turn, clap, right, clap, left, grump, 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 turn, clap, right, and then down the line, then to the line. And I'll put those two parts together before I move on to the next thing, just to make sure they understand the sequence, to make sure that they understand sort of where they go, because the, the problem of that song is them forgetting like what comes next. And so in each step, if you go back and retry again, they'll be able to remember a little bit better. So I guess all that to say, simplify first, and then take things slowly out of time and then speed them up when the kids are ready. Make sure that they have the, the movements down before you try and put it to a beat and trying to get them go a little faster. So an another example is um, to simplify is to take out the form, to take out sort of the end goal and just think more about the movements. So for example, um, if you're doing like a circle dance or something, um, so if you're gonna do the smidgy, if you're gonna do uh, a circle mixer or something else like that where you're in a big circle, instead of starting them in a circle, maybe start them out in spread out spots or if you know they have to have a partner, maybe have them spread out with their partner and then just practice the movements because sometimes the circle complicates things. So if you can have, if it's a thing where it's like, um, walk and then swing your partner or like you know walk and turn or walk and reverse or whatever if there's an, an action where they have to walk like around in a promenade position or do something else maybe have them do that out of the circle first just in a straight line and then have them switch and do it so that sort of simplifies so then when you go ooh, now we're gonna come to make a big circle shape we're gonna do the same thing that we already did but now it's just in the shape of a circle that's a little bit easier than them trying to the very first time they do the action, try and get it to fit into a circle. Um, another example of, um, like another example of that taking it away from the form is Sasha. So when I teach Sasha, um, instead of going, or sorry, if I'm not, oh yeah, <laughs> teaching Sasha. If I, instead of, you know, starting them with partners, I teach them the basic ideas first. So Sasha starts with, you know, pointing your finger at your partner going, Sasha, Sasha, Ras, Dva, Tri. But instead of starting with that, I start with, ooh, you know what? This song comes from a place called Russia, and in Russia they have names that are different than the names we know. And I go through a little bit about, you know, like Vladimir and, um, you know, Katarina and whatever. We talk about, and then there's this name, Sasha. Oh, it's a very common name. Say Sasha. And they say, say it again. Say Sasha, 
Sasha. And they say it. And I'm like, oh, now you say it like you're angry at her. Say Sasha. Sasha. Or you're angry at him. Sasha. Great. And then, then we're going to say, ready, set, go. Well, actually not ready, set, go. In, in Russia, they say, uh, one, two, begin. But we're not going to say that either. We're going to say, um, one, two, three. So let's try Sasha, Sasha. One, two, three. Oh, good. But in Russia, they don't speak English. They speak Russian. So let's change it. So then we learn the Russian words. So instead of just starting with Sasha, Sasha, Ras, Dva, Tri, I'm giving them a little bit more context and sort of layering in things so that they're successful at every step of the way. So then we, when we do get to the part, you know, that, that moves a little bit faster, then they, they've got everything up to that point already. They're ready to go. Um, and we do all of that. We learn all of those parts before we ever get to a partner. So we go Sasha, Sasha, Ras, Dva, Tri, then right, 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 left, 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 both, 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 knees, 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 right, 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 left, 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 both, 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 knees, 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 la, 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 hey, la, 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 hey, and we do the actions just like this, it looks so silly, but when they get to a partner, then I'll go, hmm, when you're going right, 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 left, 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 both, 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 knees, 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 can you do that with your partner, and they'll go like, yeah, of course. And they'll be able to translate that and make that addition, right? And then when you're doing this, if you learn this in your standing alone position, when you get to your partner, you go, you know, I think you could hook your arms together in the pretzel shape and do a swing your partner. And then they're able to just run right into that. But they, if, if you have them do the, the actions alone in their own spot first, then they're not distracted by their partner. They're not confused about that. They, they're able to master it all before you add in the next layer of a partner. So just another thing of like simplify it, take out those things that are gonna cause them ways to trip up and, and have them uh, learn things sort of out of place, out of the, the form before you get there. Um, a couple other great tips that I got from that article I recommended, the one that I linked, um, written by Peter Amidon, his uh, not so extensive list of completely random things or whatever, <laughs> I can't remember the name of that article. But um, a couple things that he said that are really great, he said always wear a microphone if you're going to be teaching because kids are naturally going to want to talk or even adults, they just want to talk, they want to get through. And so for to make sure that kids can hear you, um, it really is worth wearing a microphone. I talked before about how I wear a microphone all the day, every day, um, but I, I think uh, Peter's absolutely right that, that wearing it, especially for folk dance, is so important because you know, even today as I was teaching a dance, I was like, oh, they're talking. But, and then I realized they're not talking like, oh, hey, remember, you know, blah, blah, blah on the playground. They're talking about the dance like, oh no, we need to make sure we're doing, you know, we got to link arms here or, oh no. And then I saw a kid was translating and I could see them doing the motions for like, you know, right and left and trying to explain to other kids. So th they really were trying to do the dance, but they needed the chance to talk it out and work through it. As I was doing um, a workshop last week, um, uh, the adults there were also talking not about other silly things. They were talking about the dance or talking about the steps. They needed the chance to talk it through. And so if we as adults need that chance, kids probably need it too. So wearing the, the microphone just helps kids to hear a little bit better. It helps to get attention when we need it. It's totally worth it, especially for folk dance times. Another one that he said in his article that I thought was really brilliant was to have kids tiptoe in. So if you're in a big circle and you're in the action is like in and out, you're going to walk in for four, walk out for four, you tell kids to tiptoe or to use finger practice first. So in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Great. Now tiptoe it. And then they'll tiptoe in, tiptoe out. If you do that a couple times, then you don't even have to say like, take small steps, otherwise you're going to run into each other. If you just give them the tiptoe and the small steps and keep emphasizing the little increments first, probably their steps won't be quite so big when you say, ooh, now we've got to walk it. Okay, nice small walking. Here we go. You know, so it, it's nice to be able to um, give those little little lead-in things. So when he said um, to, to tiptoe in first, that's a great word that helps kids uh, focus sort of their movement and then the finger practice is a really great idea too. So mostly though when I think about teaching folk dance I like to teach about think about simplifying. Figure out like what's the first thing and then what's the next thing and then what's the next thing. So as we're you know thinking down the line I, I like to think about well, where do we need to end up and then where can we simplify first? What can happen next? What can happen after that? So that that we're 
you know, simplifying, giving kids a way to master before we add another layer. Folk dance, it's really easy to get caught up in the, well, I got to get to the end point or got to get to whatever and to, to complicate. But um, I, I like to be able to do small steps and, and, and build on that. That's why a lot of times I don't ever bring in like the jig music until the very, 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 very end. I'll sing silly things like, you know, if we're doing seven jumps, I'll do like da 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 da. I'll sing that first, and then, um, I'll you know, once we're ready, we'll get into the recording. Or, you know, like if we're doing the grumpy march, I could see I'll just call out what we're gonna do: grump, 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 turn, clap. Right, clap, left, grump. And and if I say that, it, it allows me to stop right away if I need to. It allows me to slow down the tempo if I need to and also not run over to, you know, stop the song. But but simplifying and, and taking it out of time, taking it slowing down, that, that really helps too. Okay, I've talked about a lot of stuff. But I hope that's sort of um, given you a few ideas about folk dance. But let me just recap what we've talked about today. Um, at the beginning of the video, we talked about um, children's books, um, great books for Hispanic Heritage Month, but great books for uh, all the time, where you can get those books at a discounted rate, um, where you can find those books and ideas about that. We talked a little bit about lesson planning, how to plan for yourself, how to plan for your administrator, how to plan for a way where you can advocate a little bit um, and also be prepared for every lesson. That was sort of in the middle. And then I talked a little bit about folk dance, some of the resources you could use. Um, I, all of the sort of tips and things I talked about today really came as an inspiration from my third grade plans because we're getting ready for our family folk dance night. So that all sort of pulls in from, from my third grade lessons, which I shared a little bit about last week. Uh, and if you have ideas about family folk dance night, please send me a message with those because I'm getting ready to have one of those for the first time. So um, I'm really excited to um, learn how y'all do it because I think I know where we're going, but I'd love to have your advice. Um, Debbie says, where are the Amadon links? On the links page, if you're on Instagram, you can click my link in profile and find Musical Monday's recap. If you're on Facebook, the caption at the, at, on this video at the very bottom is a link that takes you to music, uh, makemomentsmatter.org slash video slash Musical Monday's recap 2019-2020. And on the um, link for tonight, week seven, you'll find those links to the Amadon books and also to Peter Amadon's article on the AOSA website. Um, how long do you take to teach the music before you have the final product? Jennifer asks for folk dance, I'm assuming. Uh, it depends. Um, it, you know, it just really depends because it depends on the song, how long the song is. It depends on what we're using the song for. It depends on if I can um, add in a snippet and then go forward. You know, there are all sorts of ways that you can simplify and make things a little bit easier and get to that final product. So for some, for, for an example, um, with the song I'm doing Old Brass Wagon, well, the first time I teach it, I only teach verses one, two, three. And then we, perf we perform it that day. We do the final product. Well, then the next time they come to me, guess what? There's actually a verse four and there's a verse five. And verse four is swing your partner. Verse five is do -si do but we got to do the first three verses first. So we add those in, we learn the two new verses, and then we put it all together. End of the next day. Well, the next day you come in, actually there's a verse six. I didn't tell you that last time, but there's a verse six. So doing that incrementally means that on each day I can have like a final product that's not actually final, but, but being able to stop them, you know, after this part of day one, after verse three, well, that was really great. Let's put it all together and then we got to move on. And the next time add in another verse and then put it all together and then we got to move on. But, but doing that incrementally sort of helps um, them feel like, oh, we've accomplished something. And it's the same for other dances too. Like maybe you're doing a dance and the Amadons mentioned this too. Maybe you're doing a dance where there's like a mixer. Well, learn, maybe there are a lot of other cool actions you can do and instead of doing the mixer part, you just take that part out to sort of simplify what you're doing. You could have a finished product that day where you do all the actions, but then don't switch partners and then do all the actions again, but don't switch partners. And maybe the next time they come back, you add in the switching part, but simplifying so that you can have like a finished product at the end of the day is cool. And then, you know, knowing you can add on more later is also cool. I hope that makes sense in context, but um, simplify however you need so you can have that sort of cool end of day um, example. 
Okay, I talked about a lot of stuff tonight. Um, there's a lot on the links page. If there's something I left off, please send me a message. Um, I'm gonna, I'll add that back in. Um, and a couple just recap things. I'm excited to be at the Tidewater Area Orf Chapter uh, workshop, and that's gonna be in Norfolk, Virginia at Old Dominion University on October 19th. If you're around and you'd wanna come to that, it'd be so cool to see you. Um, and uh, there are links to that event on the links page. Um, and I just did a blog post about uh, books for Hispanic Heritage Month. If you're interested in the books that I'm using or want to see more or at least want to like snag the ISBN number and um, a couple of pictures and see how that book, what that book looks like, uh, check that out. That newest blog post is on my blog, makemomentsmatter.org, and you can, you can find it at the top of the, the blog feed. As always, um, I really appreciate your comments and questions along the way. I try and go back and answer any questions that I didn't actually mention or talk about in the video. Um, if you want to continue that conversation, you can always join the Facebook group, which is Every Moment Matters Music Education Community, or you can email me at makemomentsmatter at gmail.com or send me a message. I'd love to answer any questions or um, try and help the best I can. Hope you have a great week and I'll see you next Monday with a whole new set of lesson plans K through five and a deep dive into one of those grade levels next week. Can't wait to see you then. Thanks so much for spending your night with me tonight. Have a great week, everyone.